Our New Testament reading today comes from the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 31. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolishness the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards, Not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not to reduce to nothing, things that are. So that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, in order that it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thank be to God. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, hear us this day. May the words that are said be your words, and may we put those words into practice now and always. Amen. In the book, A a Thousand and One Illustrations That Connect, the editors Craig Brian Larson and Phyllis Ten Elshoff offer their readers some brain teasers. So see what you think. You tell a person that there are 400 billion stars and they will believe you, but tell the same person not to touch the hot stove and they have to touch it. Why is the ground stuff called hamburger when it's made of beef? Why do you put suits in garment bags and garments in suit cases? Here's a great one. Why are there five syllables in the word monosyllabic? (laughs) And why do they call it apartments when they're all stuck together? Sometimes as a people, we are a funny lot. And the things we do and say can sound silly. Uh, They can be backwards, or they can just plain not make sense. And this concept spills out into our faith life as well. As Christians, we believe that the first shall be last. Those who wish to lead must be servants of all, and we gain life by losing it. As Christians, we believe that God sent his only Son to bring us eternal life. Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is our King. But look how we treated his kingship. He was judged by society as a condemned criminal, a criminal who endured the agony and the humiliation of a public execution. Our Lord never carried or earned any money. He was born in a barn. He was laid in a feeding trough, and he lived in a town that had a very bad reputation. As a leader, he had no office, no headquarters, and no financial backing. His associates were uneducated laborers. They were political radicals. They were social outcasts. The influential and the elite of society feared and hated him, and the unwanted of society loved him. His closest friends lacked conviction and loyalty. One betrayed him, one denied him, and the rest in his hour of need abandoned him. The man who came into this world with the praises of angels filling the heavens left the world with cries of crucify him ringing in his ears. 
And so at first glance and to the secular world, our faith in Christ may seem turned around or upside down or backwards from everything that makes sense in our world. It certainly seemed that way in Paul's time. In verse 21, Paul says, For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demanded signs and Greeks looked for wisdom, but we preach the crucified Christ. The concept of Jesus was backwards, or as Paul states, foolish. A loving, compassionate, forgiving Messiah. That's not what the Jewish person was looking for. They expected that David's throne would be restored by a powerful, conquering king. One that would eradicate their enemies and restore the Jewish people to prominence as God's chosen one. And the icing on the cake was that this Messiah was branded as a criminal and executed. How could that person ever be a savior to the Jewish world? The Greek population fared no better. They believed that Jesus did not come close in stature to their mythical gods. They wanted their savior to be full of wisdom. No wise, reputable leader would have allowed themselves to be crucified. That was kind of a deal breaker. And even today, the good news of Christ seems foolish and backwards. This notion of our Savior being a poor, humble, ordinary person who offers his kingdom to all who have faith, merit and being deserving and earning this gift plays no part in the outcome of our salvation. And the world we live in, that's madness. But to the Christian, to the one who keeps Christ in the center of their heart, all of this makes perfect sense, and we wouldn't have it any other way. We follow one whose life was, an exempl it was as exemplarily as we can imagine. Christ's life was perfect in faithfulness, in obedience, in compassion, in being selfless in all that he did. We know that believing in Christ is not backwards to our faith. We know that Christianity can be different from the world. We know it can contradict the way that others live. But in our love for Jesus, we know that God gives us all that society cannot. In God, we find a loving Lord who gives love and forgiveness and grace and mercy and peace. And I am here to tell you that in a world where it may seem foolish to believe in God, we Christians know better, and we know better than anyone else, that God is nobody's fool. Everything about our universe, our world, our lives, everything is beautifully and wonderfully made. Now, in his book, The Message, Eugene Peterson puts the Bible in his own words and he translates it in his own words and thoughts. At verse 29 of today's scripture, Peterson says, In Christ we are given right thinking, right living, and a clean slate. Nothing backwards or foolish about that. And let's see exactly what it is in Christ that we are given. First, there is right thinking. Now, Jesus was a very wise man. He, he had a lot of wisdom. And it was more than just being smart. How many times have you read in the Bible about a Pharisee or some other leader, some other educator in the Bible who tried to trap Jesus? who tried to trick him, who tried to set him up to make him do or say something that would discredit him as who he claimed to be. And I can't find one instance in the Bible and all those stories that, that it ever worked, that they were ever successful. So Jesus didn't just, he wasn't just smart, he, he had wisdom. And this is, what, this is the difference, this is what we need to have too. We need to have that wisdom of Christ, of knowing what to say and when to say or not say it. A, a wisdom that makes us live and say things in simple, honest, direct, truthful ways. Uh, a wisdom that makes us say things not with malice, but with love. Not with harm, but with kindness. 
a, a wisdom that allows us to see the good and move forward in that good each and every day. It's not about being right or correct. It's about living with wisdom. And that involves honesty. And that involves truth. Now the second thing that Peterson mentions that we see that, that we get, we are given in Christ this morning, is right living. And that seems pretty straightforward. Right living is... We're living the way Christ teaches us and shows us to live. So we give the benefit of the doubt in our living. We, we follow those commandments. We obey that golden rule we do unto others. We forgive 70 times 7. We live in a world where we are living right because Jesus is in the center of our heart. And right living is actually very easy. There's a trick to it. There's a secret to right living. Don't worry, I'm going to share it. <laughs> we live right when we realize that there is nothing we can give and do for God that God hasn't already done and given to us. When we make that realization, then we will start living right for and with God. And the third thing is a clean slate. Who doesn't want that? Because we go through life each and every day and we make mistakes. We call it sin. So when we sin, and we all do, and we all will, and we won't help it, but when we sin, we get that clean slate when we live with God. We get that opportunity to start again. We get that do-over in life. We get that fresh start. And when we put in the right thinking, and we put in the right living, we can get that fresh start every single day. And when we do it every single day, and we get a fresh start every single day, hopefully, sooner or later, we'll be doing the right things all the time. So these three things seem very simple, and they seem very easy, but they're very hard for us to do and to do well. How hard is it to have that right thinking, to have the wisdom that speaks clearly, that speaks not to hurt, but to help in all that we do? How hard is it to have the right living and to do what we think Jesus wants us to do every single day. And how hard is it to have that clean slate? Because it's not just about being forgiven, it's also living that way so that we can forgive others who hurt and offend us as well. And that's hard to do. But I'm thinking that it's not as hard as we think. I've learned from this community, and we learned this way back in September when we first met with the PNC, Everyone, at least this is, the, this is what Marsh and I took away from that meeting, from that weekend. Everyone here has a garden. Everyone in Ohio has gardens, and, and, and they all plant, and, and you, have, you have tables set up in the summer at church so that, so that you can share and, and get rid of all your excess and extra. And everybody has a garden. So, so, so here's, here's how we connect all of this. Let's make a garden. Let's make a garden of right living. Let's make a garden of right thinking. And let's make a garden of forgiving and being forgiven. So the first thing we need in our garden is we need to plant peace. Right? We need to plant peace of Christ, peace of heart, peace of soul. We need lettuce in our garden. So as we live, I'm getting nods. A lot of you have heard this. I've got the reference for you if you want to look it up in the... Uh, I'll give you the reference in a minute if you want to look it up online. But we need to plant lettuce. Let us be kind. Let us be faithful. Let us be obedient. Let us love each other. We need to plant squash in our garden. This one's my favorite. Squash gossip. Squash indifference. Squash selfishness. We need that in our garden. You can't have a garden without turnips. We need to turn up for God, turn up for church, turn up to help one another. And so we plant that garden and it grows and it cultivates and we learn how to live the way that God wants us. That no garden is complete without herbs in your garden. You say herbs, I pronounce it herbs because there's an H in it. <laughs> and we need hairs in our garden. We need to plant time in our garden. Time for study. Time for God. Time for each other. I love time. 
we also need to plan time for right thinking, time for right living, time to forgive and be forgiven, time for one another, time for being together, and time for doing God's work. Let us pray. Gracious God, be with us in all that we do. Help us to do and say all the right things. Help us to live as you intend. And help us to know that you are always with us, helping and guiding us each and every step of the way, now and always. Amen. If, if you do want to look up that poem, I got it from a book, uh, a book that's called Swindle's Ultimate Book of Illustrations and Quotes, but you can go online. If you just type online, planting your spiritual garden, it should come up. There's lots of these, they vary. The one I used was one by Ali Maddox and Teddy Trebig that had been updated and modernized. So you're welcome to that. 